Let's pray. Father God, we ask that you would speak to us this morning. We ask that the power of your spirit would move our hearts, would stir us up near the start of this new year to seek your will and to obey it more faithfully. So we commit ourselves to you and to listening to your prompting this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I guess we are all familiar with the idea of a fresh approach needing to be taken to a long-standing problem. Not long ago, I watched a pretty gripping drama on TV about a hunt for a serial rapist who had managed to evade the police for many years, and they were in complete despair about how they could catch him. He covered his tracks incredibly effectively. Now, it was a true story, and I was particularly interested in it because it was set in Croydon, the place where I grew up. Martin Clunes, who is uh, more often uh, appearing in comedies, was playing Detective Chief Inspector Colin Sutton. And he took over this investigation when it had been going for some time and not really getting anywhere. And his insistence on a totally fresh approach to that manhunt eventually resulted in the criminal's arrest and conviction. Now, maybe you can think of uh, other less dramatic examples in your own life. A problem that you've faced or known about that has seemed completely intractable before a new approach has made a difference. A new approach, perhaps not overnight, perhaps not instantly, but has eventually changed everything. Well, that, I suggest, is what we're basically dealing with in the story of King David that we get in the Bible. The fresh approach of God to a long-standing problem. The story of the Bible is the story, essentially, of God dealing with the problem of sin and its impact upon the world. Human beings are created by God in his image to rule the world and to care for it, but they go wrong. They fall into sin, meaning that everything else about the world that they've been called to care for goes wrong as well. And the first step, really, of God's solution to this is to call a special people, the people of Israel, to call a people to belong to him and to somehow be his means of sorting out the world. But this approach swiftly runs into problems as the people that God has chosen, the people of Israel, swiftly become as bad, really, as everyone else. God continues to save them and direct them, but his plan appears to be getting nowhere. And this reaches its climax, really, in the book of Judges, the seventh book of the Bible, and the rather depressing cycle that it presents. The people of Israel sin. God uh, basically makes sure there's oppression by the tribes around them. Judgment comes upon them. They call out to the God at their best they do, and God sends them a rescuer or judge to restore them. But then they sin again, and that whole cycle continues. In fact, in many ways, the book of Judges is more like a downward spiral than a cycle, because to reinforce this point about the state of Israel never really seeming to improve, even the judges that God sends themselves seem to get worse and worse, reinforcing how hopeless the situation appears to be. Samson, the last of the judges, is dreadful, really in most of the way that he lives. And it really shows that Israel has sunk to a place where things seem completely hopeless. But there's a verse towards the end of Judges, and it's repeated so that we don't miss it. And it reflects the fresh approach that God was going to take to change this situation. Here's the verse, as I say, it occurs twice. In those days, the book of Judges says, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. God, in other words, was going to do something new through the bringing of a king who would finally change this situation. And this process starts in the very next book of the Bible, the book of Ruth, 
Just when Israel is in such a state that we're asking how on earth can God's plan possibly go forward, his faithfulness is shown through the most unlikely source, a young woman, and that's surprising, called Ruth. But what's even more surprising is that she's not even an Israelite. She's a Moabitess. But her faithfulness saves not only her Jewish mother-in-law, Naomi, but it saves God's plan. As Ruth goes on to become, and there's the genealogy that shows it, the great-grandmother of King David. Now, we'll get to David in a moment, but he wasn't the first king of Israel. The first king, as many of you will know, was Saul. Saul was the person whom the prophet Samuel anointed after the people of Israel came to him and asked for a king. God made clear to Samuel that the people's request for a king represented further disobedience against God because it was based on wanting to become like the nations around them and essentially a rejection of God himself as their king. But God nonetheless told Samuel to agree to it and King Saul was the result. Now, like the judges, we're told that God's spirit came upon Saul and it enabled him to do some amazing things. But ultimately, the story of Saul is a deeply tragic one as he disobeys God's instructions and he ends up being rejected as king. And when we uh, read the accounts of what Saul did to deserve this, it does seem that he's a bit hard done by because the mistakes that Saul makes are very human ones. But that's just the point. Saul, despite possessing God's spirit, was a pretty standard king. He wasn't dissimilar to the judges that preceded him. He did his best, but his best wasn't really good enough. And that's because the king that was required for God to take his plan forward needed to be fundamentally different to everything that had gone before. And this is the basis of the statement about this special king being a man after God's own heart. These are the words that the prophet Samuel used when he was telling Saul that because of his disobedience, God was removing his kingdom from him. But now he said, your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people. And in a later incident, Samuel says something similar. He declares that the Lord has taken the kingdom from Saul and given it to one of his neighbours, to one better than him. And this is the background to that passage that Katie read to us a few moments ago, where God sends Samuel to Jesse of Bethlehem to anoint one of his sons as king. Anointing someone with oil was, and still is, because it happened uh, with our current queen back in 1953, it's a sign that God has appointed someone. And in this episode, Jesse gets each of his sons to pass before Samuel. The first of these sons, Eliab, is outwardly impressive, leading Samuel to think he must be God's anointed. But God puts him right on this, doesn't he? He says those famous words, do not consider his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks to the heart. After the rejection of Eliab, six more sons of Jesse pass before Samuel and are also rejected before the youngest, David, who isn't even initially there, he's out tending the sheep, is summoned. And God says to Samuel, rise and anoint him. He is the one. David is duly anointed, and God's spirit comes on him in power, we're told, apparently to confirm God's choice. And this is the start of the story of David, the story that we're going to be looking at in our talks during January and February. The figure most famous, of course, for killing the giant Goliath, a story we'll be looking at with Ruth Henson next week, for writing many of the Psalms and for being a man after God's own heart. And perhaps the first thing that this says to us this morning is about the importance that God places upon our hearts. In Hebrew thought, the heart isn't so much the organ that pumps blood around the body as the hidden part of a human being, the hidden part 
that directs and controls our lives. We live in a world that is dominated by how things look. It probably has been for a long time, but it's accelerated in recent times. Some of you will know and perhaps be part of social media platforms. There's Facebook, there's Instagram, there's a whole load of other things. And really it's become the most obvious manifestation of our culture and of a desperate search for affirmation. By presenting the outward signs of success and achievement in people's lives so that other people can see it and they can comment on it and they can like it and they can affirm it. People desperately seek that affirmation and we see it everywhere, but it's for outward things. And we know, if we're honest, that, that simply doesn't work. Because it promises what it doesn't deliver. That sort of search for affirmation, for our outward success, for our achievement, whether we use social media or we use some other method to try and flag that up, just simply doesn't bring what it promises. It doesn't fill that void. We always seek more. We're always searching for that elusive uh, affirmation that appears within our grasp that slips through our fingers or remains just out of reach. Now the anointing of this shepherd boy in David. The youngest in his family, as I say, wasn't even present when Jesse was first assembling his sons before Samuel. That shows that God isn't really interested at all in those outward signs of success and achievement. Those things that we can attach so much significance to and invest so much of our life in trying to sort of gain and particularly to present to others, God isn't really interested in any of that at all. What God's interested in is the hidden stuff. The hidden stuff within us. The stuff that no one sees. What God's interested in is our thoughts and our desires. What God's interested in is our motivation and our hopes. What God is interested in is our attitudes and our beliefs. It's those things that God's most interested in. And that's because they're the things that are the most genuine. And they're the things that reveal who we really are. Now the story seems to imply that the state of David's heart was already pleasing to God before he was anointed. But in our case, and perhaps in David's as well, what God is really interested in is the extent to which we're willing to have our hearts changed by him. And we do this by counting all of those outward signs of importance that we're so tempted to treasure to treat them, as St. Paul says in his letter to the Philippians, as rubbish compared to being known by God and having a relationship with him. If we put all of those signs of achievement and success to one side and come before God in the humility that acknowledges that we are nothing without him, that we're hopeless sinners, we're like that people of Israel who constantly fall, whatever our intentions, into sin again and again. If we confess that before God, our bankruptcy before him, then God can and will do something with us. God will start changing our hearts or changing our hearts further through the power of his Holy Spirit. The reason for that depressing cycle of disobedience and sin in the book of Judges, to go back to that for a moment, was because the Israelites' hearts, despite their constant rescue by God, hadn't been changed. But God's fresh approach to the long-standing problem of sin that starts to be revealed in this story was that through his choice of David, he'd begun the process of changing his people's hearts, of changing his people on the inside so that they would finally be able to obey him. Now, the transference of this from David to all of God's people was something that still lay deep in the future. But we get a demonstration of what it would look like in the story that immediately follows David's anointing. The story that uh, Katie also read to us, but which I haven't referred to yet, 
where David first encounters Saul. After David has been anointed and the spirit of the Lord has departed from Saul as it came upon David, we're told that an evil spirit sent from God arrived and tormented Saul. And the result was that David, who was a skilled harpist, is summoned to play his harp so that Saul will feel better and the evil spirit would leave him. Now, it's not really what we might have expected, is it? Having been anointed in Saul's place, we might have expected that David would set himself up against Saul and perhaps even try to kill him. After all, God had rejected Saul. Killing your predecessor if you weren't part of their dynasty, if you weren't succeeding your father on the throne or whatever, was pretty standard practice for kings in the ancient world. But here we see the very opposite, don't we? David, anointed as the king that will replace Saul, but not trying to bump him off, doing the very opposite. We see David, whether this is sort of because of his own intention or because of the way God works, we're not told. We see David instead showing practical love to Saul. And it anticipates the later parts of the story where Saul is trying to hunt David down. David becomes an outlaw later on. Saul is trying to kill him, but when David has the opportunity, David doesn't kill Saul twice. He doesn't take advantage of that. And later on, when Saul does die at the hands of the Philistines, David deeply mourns his death. And what I believe this is all illustrating is the outcome of God's work in our hearts. When David was anointed, we were told that God's spirit came upon him in power. Now, we do see shortly, we'll look at it next week, David's famous battle with Goliath. That's incredibly famous, the most famous thing about David. But it's not the first action that happens after he's anointed and God's spirit comes upon him. The first action is this story we're thinking about at the moment. And the supreme way that the possession of God's spirit and its power is demonstrated isn't by acts of might, isn't by acts of strength. The supreme way that possession of God's spirit and its power is demonstrated is through acts of love. And particularly through acts of love in the face of evil. That's the message of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That famous passage that's often read at weddings. Some of you here... If you're married, you might have had that reading at your wedding. And what the message of 1 Corinthians 13 says is that we can have all manner of amazing gifts and talents given by God's Spirit, both outward and indeed inward, but how they all amount to absolutely nothing if they're not accompanied by the greatest gift of God's Spirit, which is sacrificial love for others. And it's worth us thinking, near the start of 2022, this new year, where God is calling us to show that love. Is there a difficult situation that we're involved in, perhaps at work, perhaps somewhere else, where instead of returning evil with evil, God wants us to demonstrate that our heart belongs to him by showing love in return instead? Now, if we do that, it will probably involve patience and forbearance. It may involve others seeing us as wet and a pushover. It certainly won't involve us gaining any sort of outward badge or of success or achievement, the sort of thing that people could post, say, on Facebook. It won't be of that nature. But it will be seen and deeply valued by the God who looks to the heart. And what's more... It will be a sign to us that we belong to him. The doctrine of assurance isn't spoken about as commonly these days as it used to be, where we really know in our hearts that we belong to God. But it's a valuable doctrine, and the foremost sign that we belong to God, that our hearts are being changed by him, is when we show love in the face of evil. When there's someone who's making our life difficult, beyond belief and we decide because we're a follower of God the God revealed in Jesus Christ that we won't return evil with evil we'll seek to return evil with love instead that is a sign 
that we belong to a God who changes hearts. But, and there's always a but, isn't there? There's a pretty big problem with everything that I've been saying this morning, and it's this. King David, the man after God's own heart, supposedly, turns out to be massively, indeed hugely flawed. And that's why we've called this series King David, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. We're grateful to Nathan for producing all the visuals that we use in our sermons, the backgrounds. And in fact, if we're honest, David goes on to do things that make Saul's disobedience, the king who was rejected, look minor in comparison. And actually, the fallout as well, the fallout of Saul's sin upon Israel had some significance, but the fallout of David's sin upon Israel is absolutely huge. And we're left having to reconcile this with those statements about God seeking someone better than Saul and seeking a man after God's own heart. Now, there are various answers that have been tried to this conundrum. Some people say, well, David may have sinned, but his repentance was so deep that that's the vital difference. Maybe there's some truth in that. But I think the major answer is this. At least part of the time that we think the story is referring to David, I think it's actually talking about David's descendant, Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ, the son of David, he was the true king after God's own heart, wasn't he? And he was anointed as Israel's king at his baptism. When Jesus is baptized, it's very different from what we think of, of someone being proclaimed as a king. We think of a coronation, wouldn't we, and a crown being placed upon their head. But Jesus is anointed as Israel's king at his baptism. That's when uh, God's words affirm that, and the Holy Spirit comes to confirm that appointment by God of Jesus as king. But it's not the ultimate sign, actually, of Jesus' kingship. That comes at the other end of the Gospels, when Jesus hung on that Roman cross with a sign above him saying in three languages, King of the Jews. Now that sign put up by the Romans was intended as a cruel joke, wasn't it? But what it proclaimed was true. And it was true because that act of kingly love, when Jesus died on the cross, came from the heart of God himself. And the power of evil was broken by that act of love so that our hearts could be changed forever through God's love. But the New Testament still sees it as vital that Jesus was the son of David, doesn't it? The New Testament, and we've just had this at Christmas time and again and again in the readings we've heard, that Jesus came from the house and line of David. The New Testament sees it as vital that Jesus was um, born in the town of David, in other words, Bethlehem, that Jesus sat, as Isaiah had said, on David's throne. And of course, Jesus was the ultimate good shepherd. God's radically different approach to the problems of the world had a great deal of mystery. It involved sending a perfect king in Jesus, for whom the mysterious and vital preparation was his imperfect ancestor David. And that includes, as we'll see in this series, mysteriously and paradoxically, those terrible things that David does as much of the good. The whole of David's reign is a vital preparation for Jesus and includes the things we can view more positively and actually mysteriously and paradoxically David's most terrible actions as well. They're all being used as preparation for the perfect king in Jesus, as we'll see. And hopefully what will happen as this series continues is that it will help us to make a bit more sense of those parts of the Bible that are actually really difficult because of the awful things contained within them. Hopefully it can help us to see a little bit more the way in which God, in his love and commitment towards his world, was even willing to infiltrate evil in order to ultimately destroy it, to come uniquely in Jesus, but to prefigure that by coming within uh, Jesus' ancestor David so that that evil, which is such a problem in the world, can be destroyed through Jesus, the son of David, later on.
There'll be more to unpack as we go on through this series. But David, King David, the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's what we're going to be looking at over the next eight weeks. We'll wrestle with the different parts of David's story in the hope that every single bit of that story, the bits that are good, the bits that are bad, and the bits that are deeply and utterly ugly, can all help us to understand more of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the son of David, the descendant of David, God's radically fresh answer to solving the problems of the world and its people's sinfulness. And why? So that our hearts, the really important stuff within us, the stuff that directs the whole way we live, so that our hearts could be changed forever through his love. Let's pray.